Ayn Rand held that faith is detrimental to human life, that it's the negation of reason. We asked for your questions on the objectivist perspective on God, religion, and faith versus reason, and you submitted them. Welcome to New Idea Life, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Today, we will answer your submitted questions on God, religion, and faith. And if you have any questions that on those topics that come to mind during the show, please feel free to submit them in the YouTube Super Chat or the Zoom Q&A module. And we'll try to take up some of those if we, if we have time. Um, I'm Zimo Edgawin. I'm a junior fellow at the Iron Institute. And today with me are Aaron Smith, uh, instructor and fellow, and Mike Maza, associate fellow. Hi, Aaron, and hi, Mike. Hey, Zimo. Let's start with uh, the first question that we have that was submitted on Reddit by Torin. Religious people often argue that I am not qualified to deny or disagree with their claims because I haven't assessed all of the hundreds of complicated arguments that philosophers have offered for, for them. How does the burden of proof principle apply to this sort of situations where proof has been offered, but I don't have time to assess all of the purported proof? Can I still say the ideas are arbitrary without digging into all of the details in this kind of situation? Or is that somehow unfair to the arguments on offer? I think that depends how much you kind of understand of the issue. So objectivism, at least, holds that there can be no such thing as the supernatural. So nothing beyond or transcending the laws of identity and causality. And that as a result, there's no logical inference that can get you from the observed facts of reality where things are functioning uh, causally according to their specific identities. From it, There's no inference that can get you from that world and that world of facts to a realm or to a being that allegedly transcends any specific identity uh, and functions by what is in effect unintelligible means. Uh, so in this connection, if you're interested in the kind of question about is there a way in which one can dismiss sort of out of hand all sorts of claims about the supernatural? I would take a look at Leonard Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, uh, specifically chapter one, because he deals with this issue about the concept of the supernatural, why objectivism rejects it on like fundamental philosophic grounds. So let me just read one really short passage from that chapter uh, that's on this issue. He says, there is, quote, there is no logic that will lead one from the facts of this world to a realm contradicting them. There is no concept formed by observation of nature that will serve to characterize its antithesis. Inference from the natural can lead only to more of the natural, i.e. to limited, finite entities acting and interacting in accordance with their identities. Some entities do not fulfill, or sorry, such entities do not fulfill the requirements of, quote, God, or even, quote, poltergeist, as far as reason and logic are concerned, existence exists and only existence exists. So it's a close quote. But I would take a look at that. I mean, I think if you understand that issue of what the, what the supernatural can, is or what it what it's, consists of and why it's fundamentally irrational, then, yeah, I think you can dismiss all sorts of claims about the supernatural just out of hand and responsibly. Yeah, so I, I agree with yeah I, I agree with what Aaron uh, Aaron saying, and I I want to add though that the way the questioner uh, the way Turin poses the question is he asks about arguments for religion, and some of those arguments might specifically about be about whether or not some godly uh, being exists, um, but he also might have in mind uh, arguments for taking seriously the content of one religion versus another, like their revelations or their tradition. And I, I think it's important to dis, disentangle those two, um, those two kinds of arguments, not in that one is, um, uh, you know, po one might be valid and the other wouldn't just how you might approach them um, 
uh, psychologically how you uh, how you what what lessons you might get from thinking them through. So the first class of arguments, the kind of arguments that attempt to reason from facts about the natural world to the supernatural, those I think are probably worth uh, engaging with so you can get to the point where, as Aaron put it, you understand you understand the points that Opar is making. I think part of how you might get that, uh, you can get that understanding is thinking through attempts to get from facts about causality to something supernatural, non-causal, and how they, how they fail. So <clears throat> that's a more taking uh, sometimes called natural theology arguments, that, it, that is arguments that reason from facts about nature or attempt to reason from facts about nature to the existence of a god. You, you might take those um, a little more seriously versus the arguments that uh, my religious tradition is the true religious tradition because of the beauty of its theodicy, or these are the kind of things people say. Why should you believe in the resurrection uh, of Christ? Well, because the the theory of uh, of God it, it implies is more beautiful than alternative. People have written whole books trying to make that kind of argument, and those I think you should take not in any respect seriously. I mean, what it's trying to do is convince you that somebody's um, made up stories are uh, are true. I'm talking specifically here about the content of revelations and believing believing those revelations. So <clears throat> a lot of times people who go through like a break with the religion they 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 got a, as as a kid, you know, from their family and their community. They're they're really worried, and I, I think you know it's good. It's a good um, um, worry to have. Just about thinking, why do all the people around me take these stories seriously, and I'm questioning them, and they don't want me to question these these uh, stories. And well, there's arguments in favor of taking these stories seriously, and I think it's important if you're in that kind of position to take a step back and recognize what you're doing you're worried about arguments in favor of a religion you're very familiar with you're not worried about arguments in favor of other religious traditions are you so if you're raised uh, a christian you're probably not and you're and you're questioning that you're probably not stressing about um the arguments that the uh, pro or that the uh, writing of the Quran is so poetically beautiful that it must be divinely inspired. Um, you're not worried about arguments about uh, um, 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 alleged miracles by the Hindu gods in, in in India, and you're not worried about whether or not Buddhist claims of reincarnation are are, are true. Um, <clears throat> So I think it's important to, this is sometimes called like the, uh, I think Aaron, you, you taught me this, the outsider's test for truth is you got to take a kind of perspective on um, how seriously would I take the claims of my own religion if it weren't my own religion? And you could just think if you're, you know, if you're a Catholic, say, um, and you go to mass and somebody dressed in wizardly clothes, clothes as a kind of special magic spell and now what's clearly wine is supposed to be blood even though it doesn't look like blood. like if you're a catholic that is something you take really seriously but if you're not a catholic that's completely weird and from the other perspective if you're a catholic and you read the mormon stories about joseph smith being spoken to by an angel and he digs up golden tablets that reveal that jesus visited the native americans you you probably think that's nuts. Um, <clears throat> so if you're grappling with breaking with your own religion, I think it's it's important to take this uh, fact of religious disagreement um, seriously, this outsider's uh, test um, for truth. Um, and Ooh, just have, ask yourself, uh, one, one, one more thought, just, you know, if you're in that kind of position, ask yourself really, why should I take the revelation, the alleged revelations I'm familiar with any more seriously than competing ones. And I think that's the sense in which 
Um, I, I mean, when I said earlier that, that these things are all made up stories, that's the sense in which if you have, if you start to ask yourself that question, it becomes more obvious that these are just stories somebody's manufactured that have caught on with a lot of people. And I don't need to take this seriously. Because it's how you, the way it's how, you people make- typically, it's how people typically view the religious, the stories of other religions. Yeah. Well, those are just stories. But why is that? I mean, why is it that, why is it that they are just stories, but yours isn't just a story? And I think it's part of realizing just how parochial people can be about religion and their concern with truth and whether they're concerned with truth. Because I think if you really were concerned with is my, is the, are the stories that my religion is handing down to me from tradition actually true? I mean, part of the question is, well, are there reasons to think they're not true? Are there other stories that are alternatives to this? What do I think of those? And what standards am I applying when I look at my own religion? And what standards am I looking at? Am I using the same standards when I look at claims of things that are more alien to us in terms of our experience? Like, I don't know much about Hinduism, for example. But, um, and, you know, my wife and I visited a, a Hindu temple, uh, just to kind of exploring and looking around what's here in California. Uh, I don't know if you've been in one or maybe they're not all, all the same inside, you know, but uh, we went in one. It was very, to, to my experience, very alien. Um, and, uh, you know, but that might be the case both ways, you know, so it's to get out of that sort of more narrow parochial mindset and ask yourself just how objective are you being, uh, and are you taking other claims seriously with the same seriousness you'd take your own? Yeah, I have a question that's related to that, although maybe it's more of a general question. Is there anything about the very concept of God uh, that objectivism has to say? Well, I mean, if you take the sort of, a, at least what is familiar to us as a traditional conception of God, you know, uh, he's infinite, he's all powerful, he's uh, incorporeal, you know, a lot of these kinds of things. Um, I mean, objectivism's perspective is that that notion of God violates every fundamental of a rational metaphysics. So if you ask, is, is God infinite? Is he capable of anything? And the answer is, well, no, not if A is A, you know, not if things have specific identities and they're delimited in that way and can only do what their specific delimited identities allow them to do, then no. Um, Can God create the universe out of nothing? Well, no, not if consciousness is the faculty of awareness and existence has primacy over consciousness. Uh, No. I mean, creation in a rational sense, creation is rearrangement of what exists in accordance with uh, the identities of the things you're dealing with. So not in violation of them. So, uh, this is why God can't work miracles. I mean, he can't make, I mean, there's no God. <laughs> so it's not like there's a guy and he can't do things. But the notion that there's a God that can work miracles means that there's some being that can make, by consciousness, make things do what they can't do, what they have no capacity to do. And in that sense, it's just a violation of identity, causality, any kind of sense of um any kind of rational metaphysical principles, I think. So it's, uh, there's something problematic with the concept itself and what it's supposed to imply. Okay, uh, let's move on to second question that we have uh, from Rick, uh, who submitted this question on Facebook. Rick asks, could you address the common claim that without a God, you cannot have morality? Well, there's a longer presentation of this that uh, Ankar Gatte did. Um, I think it was called, uh, Can There Be Good Without God? So he did a a short podcast on this. And then we had another, uh, an article that he wrote uh, for New Ideal uh, about this. So if you're interested in that issue, I would say take a look at both of those. But but to give you something here, just in the live broadcast, um, this is really, I think, an epistemological question. So in effect, how would we know what's good and evil? How would we know what's right and wrong? How would you have knowledge of a morality if it weren't for uh, a mystical being giving us the answers? And I think the short answer is, well, you'd reach that knowledge by the same methods you reach to reach any knowledge. That's reason. So I think 
part of what's implicit in the question, or at least the as it's been um, raised to the questioner, uh, is that it's implicitly treating knowledge of good and evil or knowledge of morality as a kind of special case where reason doesn't apply. So, I mean, because you could take the question more broadly. How do we know how um, the components of a hydrogen atom, if it weren't for God, telling us what they are? So the question is more limited to issues of good and evil, issues of morality. Um, but this is morality in objectivism's perspective is that it's not a special case. So the facts in question when it comes to morality, the facts in question are the requirements of human life, and the values, methods, terms, and conditions that either uh, sustain and advance it, the good, or hinder and destroy it, the evil. So figuring out which is which is, I mean, it's certainly, this is a rational investigation. It's an investigation about facts, about specific kind of beings, and what their requirements are. Uh, it's a causal investigation, if you want to uh, put it that way. So again, I would take a look at Ankar Gatte's, uh, Can There Be Good Without God? And also is relevant here, is uh, Ayn Rand's view or Ayn Rand's essay called uh, "Who Is the Final Authority in Ethics," and that's in what is that? That's in Voice of Reason, I think. But it's also available on our website. You can take a look at that. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to question number three, which was submitted on Facebook by Jiri. Uh, thank you, Jiri. Jiri asks. Uh, in one of his lectures, Dr. Pickoff mentions that Aquinas's five proofs for the existence of God have all been refuted. Could you please suggest readings where the best presentations of these refutations are given? Also, have theologians acknowledged or accepted these refutations? So as, as far as um, something to read, I mean, you're going to get basically the same responses to them um, in any uh, maybe intro to philosophy book or philosophy religion book, um, the kind of stock historical responses. Um, there's some things that uh, objectivists uh, might say in, in, in particular about, about some of the arguments versus, versus others. Um, but what I, what I think if, if you want some readings for this, like historical readings, I think, to my mind, the best thing to read that's historically significant, that's not a textbook, might be Hume's dialogue on natural religion. So Hume's a skeptic, and there's a lot of things in there that that, that objectivists would disagree with. But I think he's pretty good at, at pointing out a lot of the problems with with um, the not just Aquinas's five proofs, but some, some other things. Um, for example, his uh, his dialogue on the argument from design is um i think interesting uh and also it's you know hume's a good writer it's it's enjoyable amusing um hume points out that it is a dialogue uh, yeah because it's a dialogue he points out that the argument from design uh, even if it established a designer wouldn't establish one it wouldn't even establish that there's a competent designer so you can imagine a committee of idiots designed life uh, is is kind of the picture he gives so this is, it's kind of philosophy with with a, a style. Um, <clears throat> now the things you might uh, that I think objectivism or objectivists should would disagree with in that are Hume's very much in the camp um, that religious claims are really improbable. They would require a lot of evidence to establish. Whereas, as Aaron was saying in in the beginning. Claims about the supernatural are not really the sort of things that could have evidence in their favor. So it's not right to say that they're improbable. Um, it's it's that they're outside of cognition. They're outside of the kind of thing that could you could have probabilities for. Um, now, the last part of Yuri's question about theologians acknowledging and accepting these reputations, and some actually do. So uh, I was acquainted with more than a few um, members of the clergy who are also philosophy uh, uh, philosophers when I was a graduate student. And a lot of them don't like natural theological arguments because they think at best they can establish some kind of inert um, first mover or prime mover that they don't think they could actually establish uh, the God they have faith in. Um, and they prefer an approach based on faith to establish the existence of their God, not reason. Um, so, and yeah, it's because they, these arguments aren't 
they're they're not good. <laughs> they don't establish their conclusion. I mean, even if you you know even if you've uh, spent your life um, reading uh, theology, you still maintain some ability to track an argument and see when it doesn't work. So it's not surprising that that they've been abandoned largely. Yeah, and it's something that uh, like you know I was talking about being able to. Uh, dismiss claims about the supernatural, provided you understand what's wrong with that. It, it gives you a, a, a legitimate ability to do that, or it, it gives legitimacy to one's ability to do that. But um, they are those arguments are worth looking at. Um, partly we're philosophers, so we find them interesting to look at and look at the logic and look at what the premises are, look at what some of the assumptions are. Are there background assumptions that aren't exactly in the premises? Is the whole framing, is something wrong with the framing of it? If they do establish something from premises to conclusion, what exactly is established? And is it what they're supposed to establish? Like, you know, I mean, like you were talking, or I guess Yuri was asking about the Aquinas' arguments and some of the arguments that Aquinas gives. Um, if they work to establish anything, uh, they, they would establish something like that there has to be uh, something which is the cause of motion that's not itself moved or something, or there has to be a first cause, something which starts a causal chain, or there has to be some, how do you get to that something though? There's an abstract something that's a cause, like that's not, you know, Jesus and it's not the Christian God. It's, is it, is it Allah? Is it like, so it, it only gets you to some kind of starting point in a way, if the argument even works, it gets you something like that. And there's, that's a long way from that to a religion. I mean, you know, so some of these people will call this the God of the philosophers, you know, it's, like, it's some abstract thing that you can put uh, at, uh, at the start of things in some way, but and like something your, has to your... exist necessarily if other things exist contingently. Well, if you say matter exists necessarily, okay, well, that's, you know, it's perfectly compatible, you know, with uh, the argument. Uh, it, one one thing you might get out of thinking through these arguments, um, you know, we've been saying a few times, like, y you can't have evidence for the supernatural, you can't infer something above causality from causal processes. And we've been saying, if you understand that way, you know, you can, you can dismiss the arguments. Um, <clears throat> I think something, uh, an interesting, like, exercise to go through, you know, might be to read uh, what Dr. Peikoff says about God and the primacy of consciousness in Opar, and then think about the ways in which um, Aquinas's arguments assume a primacy of conscious have primacy of consciousness assumptions, and um, it's not obvious how all of them do, but I think I think they do. And doing that exercise will help you get to that point where you can say with greater confidence and certainty that, yeah, you can't really have an argument for the supernatural. You can't really reason from the natural to the supernatural. Yeah. I'll say, I'll say just two more things. One is uh, Yuri, if you're interested in specifically Aquinas's arguments, uh, I want to point you to uh, the fact that uh, ARI, actually you might know about this, uh, but uh, ARI is hosting a course on uh, Aquinas's book, uh, the Summa Contra Gentiles. And that's taught by Dr. Robert Mayhew. And in, in the Summa, that Summa, there's more than one Summa, uh, he outlines and discusses his arguments for the existence of God. So in that course, there'll be discussion and analysis of those arguments. Um, uh, so I would take a look at that course. Uh, hurry, though. Uh, it is open to auditors, but uh, they had their first class. I think it was yesterday. Uh, so it's just started, but you can still get in and catch up on the recording if you're interested in that. Uh, one last point on this while we're talking about how do you get to, can you get from the natural to the supernatural by some argumentative means? Um, there's that point, but then there's the other point is can, can a supernatural being even serve the function of an explanation? And I think it can't at all. So I think it, it's at best a placeholder for an explanation. So it's, what it boils down to is like, where did the universe come from? God created it. Um, how come there's so much uh, complex organization of living organisms? It's because God did it. God made it that way. This doesn't actually provide any explanation at all. Because it's an unintelligible 
explanation. Because what it boils down to is, um, well, here's my explanation. And this is what I would put as a competitor to a scientific account of the answer to some of these questions. A magical being did it by magic. So now are you in a better position to understand what was going on? No, it's because, I mean, you can put it in more dignified terms. You can say a supernatural being did it by supernatural means or a divine being did it by divine means, a mysterious being did it by mysterious means. But whatever you come up with is, the answer is I have no idea. Some thing by some means I have no way of understanding or even have any knowledge of did it. <laughs> that's not an explanation. I mean, you got nothing if that's what you've got. So it can't even serve the function of an explanation. You'd have to understand what that being is and have real knowledge of it, like evidentiary knowledge. You'd have the knowledge of its properties, not just you make some stuff up. And you'd have to have knowledge, understanding of the means by which the causal means by which this alleged being effects change in the world. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you won't know any connection. So I think there's a real problem both at the level, uh, at the explanatory level as well. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next question, which was submitted by email from Glenn. And the question is, what was Ayn Rand's take on the Abrahamic religions? And did she make any, dif any differentiation in their value or quality? So, I I don't know of any discussion of this from uh, um by by her and Aaron. I don't think we talked about it. You don't know any, and I asked some other people. So I think the answer is no. She never really commented on this in, in not even in an off the cuff a side way. Um, uh, so I think there's just the answer to what was Ayn Rand's take is just we don't know. Maybe somebody who maybe somebody had a conversation with her that they could share someday, but. We don't know of anything publicly available. Um, just a, a, a small comment, just on what the question's asking. I think you have to take into consideration that modern religions and their adherents are um, unholy marriages between the teachings in the actual text and the secular values they use to interpret those texts. Um, so you have to be really careful in comparing, you know, if you kind of have this view that a lot of people who sent us questions seem to, that one of the religions is better than the other, and they'll cite evidence of the behavior of the different groups and the teachings of the different groups, like to keep into in, in mind that you're you have two things going on with those those groups at once, which is the secular values they adopt and the actual text they they're interpreting. Um, so it's, I don't think it's answering the, if there is a superiority of one over the other, it's not uh, obvious or easy, or just, you can read off by how well the Christian world is doing and poorly the other religious part, you know, other religious countries are doing. I don't think you can read it that way. It also depends on what era in history you look at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't, also, I will say like, I, I don't know enough about the theolo the theological doctrines of various religions to say, here, well, here's something I could think this is element is a little better. And so I, I, but at some point, I think that's a bit quibbly. I mean, when it's um, they're I think fundamentally wrong philosophically. Are some a little better? Is Maoism than worse yeah. than Stalinism? Yeah. Is Maoism worse than Stalinism? May maybe in some like quibbly way it, it's it murders 11 million versus 10 million like i get 11's worse but it's not an essential um kind of difference that you would make the judgment that way you just yeah. say they're both evil yeah and there's of course and then like you were saying at the outset though mike you were saying well you're talking about the own unholy marriage there is there's a heavy influx of better values that um, are living in a person alongside more mystical views. And depending on where they live, what kind of culture they live in, what era 
they live in, what the people around them are like. Um, they they could be anything. I mean, yeah. So I don't think it's an issue of theology exactly, but. Okay, good. Uh, let's move on to the next question, which was submitted on Facebook by Max. Uh, so Max asks, is it correct to say that ideologies like Marxism, Nazism, Hegelianism, etc., are religions? After all, they share the same morality as religion does, that is to live for others or another thing. And there's a, a second question to that. Dr. Peikoff mentions in, in Opar the ideas of the mystics of mind and muscle, which seem to fit in the idea of calling su supposed secular ide ideologies religions, because in practice, they all ba base their thinking on the non-real or the mystical. So to answer the question, I think we first have to think about what it is that makes a religion a religion. Um, and the questioner suggests, uh, Max suggests that it's because they share the same morality. And I don't think that's the essential that makes religions religion. I, I think it's not so much the doctrine or the content of the religion, but how it's claimed to arrive at it. So I think Max bringing up mysticism is much, um, is much more important than, than a specific doctrine. And there I want to take a broader perspective and say, you're right that these um, philosophy, the secular philosophies are mystical. And that's certainly how Peikoff and uh, Ayn Rand refer to them. But I think religion's narrower than mysticism. Uh, that is, religion's a type of mysticism, and there are other there can, there there are and there can be other non-religious types of mysticism. So just take a simple example: somebody who uh, believes they have psychic powers that, and thinks they know things through some non-rational mean. They're a mystic, and even if they have like a little theory about how they do that, and maybe they defend the claim that they had that there's such a thing as psychic mystical insight. That's not an ideology, or it's not a religion. They might not ask you to, they're, but they're mystics. Um, they believe in some non-rational way of knowing. And Marxism, Nazism, I'm, let's, uh, Hegelianism, yeah, I, I think that's fair. Those are, <clears throat> they, they are mysticism because they, as Max says, they believe in some non-rational source of knowledge. And religions also believe in non-rational sources of knowledge. But I think when you compare the source of knowledge that religions claim versus let's say the source of knowledge that Marxists claim there, there's a, there's a real difference uh, there. So um, in Marx, like doctrinaire Marx Marxism, um, I don't think this applies to some of the kind of newfangled 20th century Marxism, but Karl Marx's Marxism, there's a kind of logic that's not, the ordinary Aristotelian logic, it allows for contradictions and transcendence of contradictions called dialectical uh, logic. If you've heard dialectical materialism, you heard that expression. And that's supposed to give you some other non-ordinary uh, non logic, non-Aristotle logic way of understanding the world. Now it's mystical because it's not based in actual logic. It's kind of this fabricated fantasy logic. Um, but that's different from what religions are saying because you know, if you ask Marx, who can partic participate in the dialectical process and come to see that communism will uh, bring a utopia in the future? It, any, it, really, it's anybody or anybody who makes the effort or anybody who's trained a certain way it's it's um, uh, more universalist in in its mysticism than religions who which say that no, there's a special guy or small group of guys that God spoke spoke to directly, and if God hasn't spoken to you, you have to take them on faith that God spoke to them, 
and God laid down a special doctrine which is revealed. Marxists aren't claiming that Marx had some insight that you can't understand or comprehend and you have to take him on faith. They're saying if you participate in the in dialectical reasoning, you'll see that he's right. So <clears throat> still both mystical in that they're rejecting um, in that they're rejecting rational means of knowledge. Um, but there's there's a difference to, to mark them off. And I think that's why um, one of the uh, one of the hallmarks of a real religion is a special or sacred text which represents the revelation, uh, which and, you know, there's not going to be. Um, uh, some, uh, uh, I mean, if somebody has a new revelation, allegedly, then you just have a new religion, uh, versus a kind of, the kind of history of these various ideologies, especially Marxism, Hegelianism, um, you have, uh, um, competing developments or alleged developments that they don't appeal to revelation. They appeal to some new dialectical, uh, dialectical process that, that takes them um, forward. So yeah, I, it's all mystical uh, hocus pocus, even if people have tons of PhDs and um, write lots of books dialectically, it's still, it's still m mystical uh, nonsense, but it's not the same thing as what's going on with, with uh, mainline um, religions. Now, as to the similarities, I think it's, right to see that there can be similarities between secular ideologies and religions. But I'd be careful with saying that there's their religions in some something other than a uh, other if you mean literally this is a religion, I don't think it's true that environmentalism or Marxism are religions the way Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism are religions that they have a central figure who has some kind of deep insight who wrote who that there's text space around that are supposed to be divinely revealed that's that's different uh, and it's different enough to carve it off and give it its own category yeah i mean there has I mean, there has to be some uh commitment by faith to an element of the supernatural like, I mean, I take it, I mean, people define religions in various ways, but I take it, it's essential feature, or at least it's one of its essential features is that it's, it's a worldview that is committed to a supernatural being or realm that one can only access by faith or revelation, in other words, by mystical means, and that there's a certain kind of set of beliefs or way of living that's oriented around that. And as you said, there's often a sacred text. So yeah, there are certainly religious elements, mystical elements to um, secular philosophies. And so there's a common out, there can be commonalities, but I don't think it's right to characterize them as a religion without qualification. Yeah. So Aaron, that now that you have mentioned faith, how would you define it? Well, I mean, if we're talking about faith in an epistemological context, we're talking about faith as a as a means of knowledge or um, a way of sort of populating your mind with ideas or beliefs. I'd put it that faith is the commitment to a belief in the absence of evidence or rational proof. And the way I think it's good to formulate this is that what it amounts to is that it's you're maintaining a belief on emotional grounds uh, rather than on intellectual grounds. So it's in that regard, I mean, faith is not a means of knowledge. It's not a, a means by which you acquire or reach understanding. It's just a means of uh, holding and maintaining beliefs that don't meet the standards of knowledge. I mean, why do you need faith at all? Well, because there are things that you don't know and want to believe anyway. If you knew them, you wouldn't need faith. Do you need faith that two plus two is four? Do I need faith that I have a microphone sitting in front of me? No, I can observe that and I can prove the other. So I don't need to have faith for those things. I don't need to have faith that I work in California, right? I know these things. So what, what, so what, what uh, faith requires is some sphere of operation where reason doesn't apply. And from objectivism perspective, it's there is no such sphere. 
So, I mean, reason is your means of knowledge. If what you want is knowledge, you use reason. You don't have anything else. If you want to hang on to beliefs that don't meet the standards of knowledge and you want to hold them anyway, as if they're truths, yeah, that's faith. Um, but that's not a good way to hold or maintain ideas. You, you disconnect yourself from, from facts, from evidence, because then what one winds up doing typically is you find up having a strong emotional connection, not an intellectual connection, not a cognitive connection, but a strong emotional connection to hanging on to those beliefs. And it pushes people to then isolate those beliefs from their other knowledge, like to refuse to integrate them. So it's, um, you know, when you read in, uh, what is it, Genesis, you know, you read the ages of these people having babies, like, you know, <laughs> the guy's 800 years old and he has a baby. It's like, well, that is impossible. Given everything we know about human beings, it's, 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 it's bonkers. And it's like, well, what do you make of that? How do you integrate that with our knowledge of biology? And it's either, well, it just must have been different then. And, just, you know, you refuse to integrate. You refuse to try to interconnect that knowledge to see if you've got some contradiction. You know, or you give some lame excuse like, you know, maybe they were like keto before it was cool. Or maybe they were on the, the, the paleo diet, uh, you know, before it was hip. And, the, you know, they had better health or something like, I mean, no, you don't know any of those things and you don't have any evidence for any of these things. It's just you're making up stuff and it, it fosters rational rationalization in that regard. It's, it's a very, very unhealthy um, thing to have injected in your mind or to accept as a practice. So I think it's just really bad. And you have to distinguish, I think, faith from. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just stop there. Okay, thanks. That's uh, very hel uh, helpful. Um, let's move to the next question, which was submitted by email by Sam. Sam asks, can you explain why the concepts of gods in general and the Christian God in particular uh, are attractive to so many? So I want to sl slightly challenge or push back on the premise of the question, which is that the Christian God is attractive to so many, so many who, uh, so many Americans, so many people of European descent, so many people living in the Anglo-American world, so many humans. It's not true that the Christian God is attractive to a lot of humans. Not you know, me. Christianity, <laughs> not me, but also not many people in Asia and India. Those, those are not Christian areas that most, um, you know, East, East Asia, there's not even personal gods There are individual people there that have, that have Christian views, but on the whole, no, historically, no. Um, now God, if the question is why are gods attractive? I think Aaron, you have some things to say about, about that, but if, if it's more narrowly on the Christian God or even a personal God, I, I don't, it, there are a bunch of people who believe it. But the idea that it's attractive to some like critical mass or some like that's I don't think that's true. And even amongst the people who believe it, were they attracted to it or were they raised with it? I, yeah. I know I know of not even just know personally, but I know of very, very, very few people who had who were raised with no religious belief and then as adults adopted um, some religion. And the ones I've heard of typically marry into it. Uh, so it's not that they're attracted to the faith, but they're attracted to a person who has the faith. Um, so it's, I don't think it's true that people are attracted to the Christian God when they start from zero. What they do is something more like what Aaron was just talking about when he described faith is they have something they want to believe maybe because they've always believed it or because it's um, uh, painful to think that, your family all believes in make-believe uh, and that's kind of insulting to think that about them. So instead you convince yourself and you join the, you join the group uh, collective make-believe. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, kind of what I've been saying in part goes to what we said earlier in the podcast about thinking of not being parochial and how parochial and how you think about these things. There are other religions there are billions of people who don't have the same, not even aren't Christians, but don't even have anything like 
Abrahamic. They're not. They're not, they're not Christians. Even they're, not they're not even monotheists. They're po there's polytheists. There's I mean, Buddhism does not have personal gods, and there's a lot of Buddhists. And uh, the Shinto religion in Japan does not really have personal gods. I think there's not completely up, you know, up to speed on on their beliefs, but I'm pretty sure there's not personal gods. Um, so, so yeah, you have to think when you're asking your, these questions of yourself, you do have to think uh, more broadly than just what you're familiar with as a somebody who's raised in a Christian uh, society or, you know, if you're, if you're, um, we have people from all over the world. So if you're in the Middle East and you're thinking about the uh, Islamic version of this question, the same thing, you know, think about how would a Christian think about it? How would a Hindu think about it? How would a Buddhist, how would an, there's atheist societies that are largely atheist now. Some of the Nordic countries are largely atheistic. Um, how do you think they would think, they think about it? They're raised with no religious belief and they would look at your God, the same way you look at the God of the Greeks. Why would I believe in Zeus? That's silly stories. And so is Christianity to people who are raised atheists. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think there's also another, another way I said, uh, people are raised with, you know, the acceptance of these beliefs. But also there's a, a important historical factor is that it's not like some of these some of these religions did not spread because they appealed to a lot of people. They spread because they appealed to some people who then went and murdered a bunch of the people who didn't believe in them. Um, so a lot like uh, yeah. the history of Islam and Christianity, there's a lot of conversion by the sword, not by the pen. So um, that that also goes to whether or not these are appealing as opposed to frightening. Yeah, and in terms of uh, like why is I mean, forget the Christian God specifically for a moment is just uh, why are gods appealing to people? And I think um, I think the first thing I would say is, well, historically, um, most cultures, if not all, have had some notion of gods. And I don't even find that surprising or weird. I mean, historically, it was common for people to postulate uh, gods for explanatory reasons. You know, there had there are things there are a lot of things in the world they don't understand. In terms of lightning and all sorts of things, flood, uh, droughts, disease, plague, all the sorts of things that really affect their lives uh, can kill them, scare them, surprise them, um, make their crops grow or not grow in life or death kind of issues. And they don't understand uh, how these things come about and they draw on um, their basic source of knowing how things happen in a cause and effect way. In other words, by individual agents, people choosing to do things and willing them, you know, into action. Uh, and so they hypothesized, um, you know, unseen agents behind the scene, throwing the lightning or sending a plague or whichever, or rain. So it's not odd, I think, if you look historically. So part of the appeal is it offered explanatory reasons when they didn't have any explanation for it. And they assumed there were some kind of agents operating behind the scenes. Um, nowadays, we understand by and large how a lot of those things work, if not all of them. And so I think the explanation nowadays is largely, I mean, I'm imagining here, I've never had a desire to believe in a God. So I've never had that kind of a, like a motivation to it. My question was just, is this true? Is it plausible? Is it convincing what I'm being told? Does it match with what I know? And that's why I never had that. So I'm imagining a bit from people I know and have had contact with. But I think the explanation is largely psychological because what belief in a God allows people to do is to hang on to uh, the idea that, you know, things like death isn't the end, that, um, you know, they'll get to see lost loved ones, you know, after they die. Uh, or that uh, if, even if they made a mess of their life, there'll be some place they can go with without pain or frustration or fear, a place where they're loved, you know, you know, like a heaven or whatever. But I think it's more things like that. I mean, I, I could be wrong about that motivation. And I mean, I know that is definitely part of the motivation for many people. But is that the sum total? You know, I don't know, partly because religion offers you some kind of a worldview and you need a worldview. And this is usually the first thing you get. 
Um, and for some people, it's all you get, you know, for, for a kind of a comprehensive picture. Like, this is my nature. This is the nature of the world. This is how I relate to it. This is how I should function in it. And another thing more narrowly is that uh, for most people, I keep saying for most people, uh, I don't know if I, I, I use it too much, I think. I don't know if it's exactly true to say most people, but it's certainly true for many people that when they think of morality, they think of religion. Religion is the source of morality. Religion is where you get that. And I, I know people who don't believe in God, but they take them to church and things because they think, well, it'll be good for them because they'll get a kind of a moral compass. They'll get a sense of right and wrong and morality. And it's not really super important that there is a God and a heaven and stuff, but I want my kids to have a morality. And that's just a major default on the intellectual culture, a default of the intellectual culture of not providing a rational morality that like that you could teach your kids and you don't need to send them to, uh, you know, Bible study or something. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so let's move to, uh, I think, the last question, which was submitted by email by Vic. The question is, how would an objectivist respond to the Buddhist claim that desires and, uh, and attachments cause suffering? And there is a elaboration on this question. A Buddhist may say that since nothing in the world lasts forever, it cannot provide true and lasting uh, happiness. Only, near, only near, nirvana can. For example, if you love someone, they will eventually get sick and die, causing you sadness. Therefore, it is better not to become attached to them in the first place. So how would an objectivist respond to this question? Well, I think the first thing to say is that objectivism is not a philosophy for um, avoiding suffering. I mean, that's not its goal. Any philosophy will have something to say about that. But this is objectivism is not about avoiding suffering. It's about achieving values. And I think that the danger here is with the that kind of uh, sort of Buddhist perspective is that eliminating your desires in your attachment means eliminating values from your life. I mean, that's what you desire, some some value, and that's what you become attached to. So in, in order to really, truly eliminate your desires and attachments, you'd have to eliminate your values. And that means getting rid of everything in life that makes life worth living, worth pursuing, worth keeping, hanging on to. Um, so it's true that valuing things, caring about them, becoming attached to them, not wanting to lose them and so on, involves the possibility of loss and it involves the possibility of pain. And you're right, people have lifespans and they do die. And that's the fact that we have to deal with. Um, but detaching yourself from everything you care about, I think only it serves to extinguish the self and every reason you could possibly have to want to live. Uh, in that sense, it's just suicide. It's just uh, erasing the self. I mean, I think that's part of the point, I think, within Buddhism is to try to eliminate the self, but I'm not uh, very knowledgeable about Buddhism. Uh, but And there's a heavy element of this uh, in Stoicism as well, this idea that you have to, if not eliminate attachments uh, to things, eliminate, it's, yeah, it's that you have to severely restrict it, severely restrict what you value or take seriously. Uh, or take as important uh, to limit the amount that you could care about something, you know, because it's just, otherwise you concern, you have concern about it, you have loss, you have anxiety, uh, you don't have that unperturbed state uh, that the Stoics are aiming at. So if they're not saying e eliminate them entirely, they're saying massively restrict them to just a few things about internal character and stuff. But, I think both are both are both are dangerous in that regard. I think it saps your emotional life and the real love of it because there's much more to life than virtue and nirvana. Well, non-self is the right way to put it, and life is pro-self. Yeah, I want to uh, add two things to what Aaron says. Less so much on the actual content but just on 
thinking of thinking through questions like this about uh, religious claims. So one, interestingly, at least I don't, I don't know the core Buddhist texts to know whether or not these sorts of arguments are in them. But if there's a sacred text that gives you an argument, then that's just an argument. You can, you can think through the way Aaron did. Is this true? Is there other good reasons for it? Versus if a sacred text just makes a bald assertion about what you can and can't do, you can't have dairy products on meat. Why not? Well, God says like, that is not something you can reason about. It's just an assertion. Somebody might external to this text give you some kind of reason why it's you know unhealthy or something. But that's that's not a religion anymore. Um, <clears throat> and the other is I, um, there must be some people who hear this claim from Buddhism and just find it weird, implausible. What do these strange Buddhists believe? Why would you even think that? And, um, no, I think it's worth noting that if if you have that reaction to Buddhism, but um, you know you're in the throes of Christianity, and you don't think Christian calls to, for sacrifice are strange or weird, what? Why? Why not? It's probably because one's familiar and the other's not. If you're comfortable with people say the Christian one all the time where you live and you hear that a lot and maybe your parents or your teachers tried to guilt you using it. And no one ever tried to guilt you using Buddhism. Um, so I, I, this is just uh, um, practicing what we preach. Think, think about other religions and how they, uh, how they uh, approach life and whether or not they have good reasons for them. And uh, you should pry, apply that, those kind of questions to your, to your own religion. Yeah, and that's part of the value of philosophic thinking is to sort of get outside um, a narrower, a narrow, I don't mean negative, just being narrow, uh, a narrower perspective that you have and looking at other perspectives and how they see the world and then taking seriously that you're not hanging on to beliefs that you hold dear. You're looking for the truth. You're on a quest for truth and you're following reason and the evidence wherever it leads. And if you're really doing that, if that's really what you're concerned and you're not, you know, faking it or lying to yourself, um, it, it's worth looking at. I mean, if you take religion serious, it's worth looking at other religions. I think it's, it's really valuable. It help, I think it gets you out of that sort of parochial sort of perspective. And then looking at some of these ideas that we've been talking about, about thinking about, you know, if I think of God in as a supernatural being, what does it really mean to be supernatural? Like, what does that amount to? And how would you establish that? And what would it look like? Is it possible? Uh, are there principles about the world that we know are true that these violate? The, so it's more look, looking at it as a philosopher, but then also having a more philosophical in the sense of abstract perspective on the whole phenomenon of religion, religious belief. I think it's a, it's a good, I shouldn't say curative. <laughs> it's a good um, therapeutic practice. Yeah. Well, practice. yeah, it's a good, it's, it's a good kind of practice to, and it, it's not just applied to religion. So this podcast is about religion as a subject, but the idea could be about government. It could be about political views. It could be about all sorts of things. Yeah. It could so, be about so, objectivism. It could be about all you know. So yeah, you should yeah. Learn, learn some other yeah. philosophies and think about how they compare and whether or not one has the uh, right view or the other. Yeah. Cause in the end, it, it matters because you, sh you shape your life around these things. And if you shape your life around falsehoods, it's a real problem. I mean, you can wreck your life like that or fail to get and uh, miss out on, fail to on move a better life. Yeah. 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 Okay. We need to we, start wrapping up. Oh, well, you can start wrapping right. up. Do we have um, any time for a question or two or no? Uh, well, I think we could take, if there's one you wanted to, uh, we're particularly interested in answering, I think we could. Do something in a minute or two, right? Yeah, I think so. If Zimo, do you have time? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, I think one was uh, uh, sent in. What did Ayn Rand mean when she said that uh, I see religion as a primitive form of philosophy? I think we can answer that briefly. It's just a first stab at answers to fundamental questions about who, who am, what am I, where am I? 
And how do I function in the world? And it says, well, you know, you're the product of this being, this being created everything, and there's a purpose and you kind of fit into it. And it gives you a sense of, okay, I have a framework now. Now, there's a lot that's wrong with it, but the, the idea that you need a framework, yeah, that's great. You need a framework. Um, and it helps people orient themselves in life. The question is, you want, to, but the issue is you want a true framework. So you want to upgrade from a religion, which is, you know, based in kind of mystical ideas and supernatural dimensions and faith and ignorance, uh, to philosophy, which at its best is a rational, logical endeavor, which, you know, identifies the facts of human nature, the facts of the world, and integrates that into an identification of how to live. So, yeah, so that's what she means. Yes, something that I think makes this point harder to understand is um, nowadays there aren't a lot of competing secular philosophies as ways of life. Yeah. So there is this: the secular world uh, controls all the major institutions in the United States. I think that's true, but there's not like a systematic. Um, a set of guidance that you could identify with 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 um with that versus religion versus some other competing secular philosophy um and it, it, one one bit that's valuable about learning about the ancient world the, especially the ancient greek world is that there were uh at one point in time competing secular world views that were identifiable and had a teachings and communities and so there was stoicism and epicureanism or two that i think we've we've mentioned now it now there's objectivism um they're kind of aristotelian inspired uh philosophies of pythagoreanism uh all of the and these weren't religions they weren't based in um revelation or dogma. sacred texts they were attempts sorry they have no dogma yeah, they but didn't have dogs. The things you're supposed they to had, believe. They had to teachings. Well. Yeah. yeah, they had teachings that they would give you reasons for accepting. And then based on the reasons, they'd give you guidance for living. Um, we don't really have that anymore, or at least in the United States. I don't, I'm not sure about elsewhere. I mean, there's a kind of revival of that. There's stoicism, there's objectivism now. Maybe there'll be an Epicurean revival someday, and maybe there'll be something new. But. It's hard, it's harder to understand the point where your only point of contact is what I learned in university about philosophy, which isn't really a worldview and then religion and then maybe objectivism. That's not, might not be enough data points to, to sort it all out. Yeah. Okay. We need to wrap up. Uh, thanks everyone for submitting your uh, questions. Uh, thanks for your kind donations. Uh, via super chat, we we're sorry that we couldn't get to your uh, questions. Now, uh, next week, uh, the next week's show uh, is titled The Islamophobia Controversy at Hamelin University. And it will be uh, next week, Friday at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and it will be uh, our presenters will be Aaron and Onkar uh, Gatay. Now, if you enjoy this podcast, please su subscribe to our channel on YouTube uh, and click the bell uh, in order to get notifications for when we go live or when we post new recordings. Also, if you're watching the recording of this uh, session, please like, comment on or share the episode if you enjoyed it. Uh, it will help us attract new uh, viewers. And lastly, if you have questions or comments about today's episode or you have suggestions for future episodes, please email us at newideal at einrand.org. We, we read all of your emails and we reply to many of them. So thank you for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and that you will join us uh, for the next week's uh, discussion. And thanks to you, Aaron and Mike. Thanks for thanks, thanks for moderating, Simon. <laughs>